Nucleic acids, the structure and function of DNA and RNA. We're going to look briefly at the way nucleic acids work and how everything is put together. This has relevance whether we're looking at plants, whether we're looking at animals, whether we're looking at bacteria. There may be small differences between each one of these, but these differences are not significant. When we look at nucleic acids, there are a couple of different things we look at. We look at DNA. DNA is deoxyribose nucleic acid. DNA is basically for information storage, which means it contains all of the information that you need to make up your organism or whatever organism you're looking at, and it is normally double-stranded, and we abbreviate that DS. We also have RNA, and RNA is for information retrieval. Basically, it takes the information from one spot and it applies it somewhere else. So it's a little bit different. It is normally single-stranded. And the difference between these two comes down to a little bit in structure and the concept that one is normally double-stranded and one is normally single-stranded. When we look at RNA, there are many different types. We have what we call messenger RNA. And messenger RNA is the material that takes the information from the DNA and then takes it out to the ribosome where it can be read and then it can be used to manufacture a polypeptide. We have transfer RNA or tRNA. And tRNA is a very interesting one. It's got a format that looks like this. We normally call it a clover leaf because you can see the three parts on it and it has a place on the end of it where it can pick up an amino acid and then it carries that amino acid to the ribosome where in the ribosome it is used to put together proteins. When we look at this, we're going to talk about codons and codons are part of the transfer RNA and they're also part of the messenger RNA. We have what we call ribosomal RNA or rRNA. And these are interesting because these with ribosomal proteins make up the ribosomes and the ribosomes are what read the messenger RNA and use the transfer RNA in order to be able to produce polypeptides. And the last one we have in here are small RNAs or small interfering RNAs. And these have just been recently discovered this millennium and they are small little pieces of RNA that have certain codes on it. And when it matches up with something else that has the same code, it'll adhere to it. And when it does that, it stops whatever the other thing is doing. So they call them small pieces. They're interfering and they're constantly looking for the right ones because if you could find the right ones, you could probably stop a virus that makes you sick from even acting. So these are really cool things and they're looking at these for the future. All of these are made up of nucleotides. Basically, what you have in a nucleotide is we have two types. It says we've got purines and we've got pyrimidines. And the purine looks like this. Now, in here, we can see a couple of things. This particular one we call adenine. In the center of it, we've got that little five-sided ring with a oxygen in it. And that is your sugar. Off on the left side, we've got a P, which is a phosphorus. So these are a sugar phosphorus group. And then on the right side, we have got this ring structure that's got all these nitrogens, and that would be a nitrogenous base. So you put the three pieces together, the phosphate, the sugar, and the base, and you get the nucleotide. The purines have these larger structures like that, and that would include adenine and guanine. The pyrimidines have a slightly smaller structure, and that would include thymine. And here you can see the sugar on the center, the phosphorus on the right, and the base on the left. Now, I've just oriented these like this so we can show you what actually happens with them. And we have cytosine, which is the same way. And when we look at these, these bond to each other. Adenine pairs up with thymine and guanine pairs up with cytosine in DNA. And when they do that, they give you what we call a base pair. When we deal with RNA, we've got a pyrimidine that's called uracil. And it's just slightly different than thymine. So in RNA, adenine and uracil make a combination pair. And in RNA, you don't find the thymine. When we look at DNA structure, we see this. And here we've got a pyrimidine, adenine, and thymine coming together. And you can see that it shows in the center that they are bound on and they have this little attraction due to these bondings. We also could have a base pair, which is cytosine and guanine. 
And what happens here is when these come together, they make a long chain where they get bound through the sugar and the phosphorus unit, and they bind in one direction only. And you can see over here on the sugars, we can label one end a five prime end, and that's where the phosphorus is bound up. The other end is a three prime end, and that's where the hydroxyl group on the sugar is. And these will bond to each other. The five prime end goes to the three prime end of another. And what happens is at this particular case, you see the two hydroxy units. The two hydroxy units will drop a water out, and all of a sudden we will have a bond in there. When these replicate and come together, it always comes together and we have to know which end is the 5 prime, which end is the 3 prime. It's like reading a sentence. You're only supposed to be able to read it in one direction. If you read it backwards, sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. When we look at DNA replication, what we've got is we've got these two strands of material and what happens is they come apart. There's an enzyme that actually causes them to come apart. And as it does that, it will then build up the ends that it came apart at. Now, one of the things we look at the DNA strand is we call it anti-parallel because, again, we have to know which is the three prime end and which is the five prime end, and it only builds in one direction. So what happens is it's going to build on the one side, which means it can give you a continuous strand. On the other side, it has to build it in little segments. The other thing we talk about with DNA replication is it is semi-conservative. And what that means is that when you replicate the DNA, you no longer have the original molecule because the original molecule was actually cut in half to build another half onto it, which is different than normally what we think of when we replicate something. If we send something off to the copy shop, we get our original back, plus we get the copies. Here, you don't get your original back. Your original has now become incorporated into two different strands. So it's conservative for the information, but the actual molecule itself has now been modified.